Greetings, friends. My name is Jessa McLean, and I'm here to provide you with some blueprints of disruption. This weekly podcast is dedicated to amplifying the work of activists, examining power structures, and sharing the success stories from the grassroots. Through these discussions, we hope to provide folks with the tools and the inspiration they need to start to dismantle capitalism, decolonize our spaces, and bring about the political revolution that we know we need. Canadian foreign policy is not what most Canadians think it is. The narrative for a long time had been one of peacekeepers, which we now know we're anything but. Now, the federal government gave up that facade some time ago, with our approach now clearly being one of open aggression and facilitation of state violence. The impact of Canada's weapon sales, resource extraction industry, and outright participation in, in right-wing coups are felt across the globe. But are Canadians, in large part, aware of all of this? I ask our next guest, Eve Ungler, that question. He's an expert in Canadian foreign policy and an activist in his own right. He's written extensively on Canada's complicit and often violent foreign policies and its hypocritical approach to international relations. He helps us understand the political manipulations and the motivations behind our undemocratic involvement in places like Haiti, for example. Going against the grain in terms of Canada's international image isn't a popular one. It often evokes really strong responses, and there's very little space in Canadian mainstream media for work that challenges that statescraft machine. How does Eve navigate that? He talks about having to find different ways to reach as many people as possible in an area of politics that is often overlooked, even by the most politically involved, or often deprioritized in favor of domestic policies. He makes an argument that some of these issues are just as urgent and deserve just as much energy as the fight for climate action and, and workers' rights. Let's hear what he has to say on that and much more. Welcome to Blueprints, Eve. Can you introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, I'm uh, Eve Engler, an uh, activist and author based in Montreal uh, that's uh, been involved in uh, anti-corporate globalization and anti-imperialist uh, struggles for about uh, two decades and uh, author of, uh, of uh, 12 books, mostly on uh, Canadian foreign policy. I was checking out your Wikipedia page, as I do uh, for some of the guests, and I noticed we're the same age. And I feel like such an under... I, I enjoy writing. I don't get to do it a lot. But 12 books, you're making me feel like such an underachiever. That's amazing. Um, I read the Black Book for Canadian... I mean, most people who've studied political science, I think, at this point, hopefully have read uh, the Black Book for Canadian foreign policy. You use a lot of the written word to get your actions across, but... You say you're also involved in activism. So what type of organizing and activism, you know, is, is most notable for you? Well, over the years, I've been involved in uh, uh, lots of different forms of activism. Probably the most uh, sustained was uh, Haiti Solidarity Activism. We had a group, uh, Haiti Action Montreal, uh, and then the Canada uh, Haiti Action Network, that for a couple of years were doing, you know, very uh, aggressive um uh, spending a lot of time uh, on opposing Canada's role after the 2004 uh, coup in Haiti. Uh, in more uh, recent years, I have done stuff with Solidarité Québec Haïti, which is a, a sort of a, a more recent Haiti solidarity group set up here in Montreal. Um, and I've done lots of stuff with the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Institute in terms of um, um, getting uh, that off the ground and uh, we did a big campaign around opposing Canada's bid for a seat on the United Nations uh, uh, Security Council. And uh, and that was actually, uh, unlike most activism on anything to do with foreign policy, that was uh, a sort of short-term success. Didn't fundamentally change the policy, uh, but we did have, I think, a positive impact in, in convincing other countries to vote against Canada's bid for a, a Security Council seat. Um, and then I've been involved with the Disruption Network Canada, which is a sort of uh, informal group uh, that was set up before the pandemic uh, that disrupted mostly liberal uh, ministers or the prime minister, politicians on uh, on different international issues from Venezuela to uh, to Haiti to uh, climate crisis to Palestine. 
Um, and then over the past, I guess, much of the last year, uh, sort of informally, we've kind of uh, got some of that uh, going back again. I imagine Canadian foreign policy isn't an easy place to navigate. I mean, in Canadian politics, we can talk about different policy items somewhat cordially. There's a few hot ticket items that just like, you know, um, bring out the worst in everyone. But generally, there can be a discussion. I find Canadian foreign politics and or talking about international relations a little Orwellian, right? In that clear lines have been set. There are good actors and bad actors. We're not to really question that. How things are reported on is obviously slanted that way to that really kind of like bipolarity, you know? A lot of it is red baiting. But when you question that and when you challenge that, that's not very popular. I imagine you face a lot of backlash. Not We'll talk about your tactics later because uh, you're talking about disrupting foreign minister or ministers' meetings and whatnot. But just generally taking the stand that you do on Canada and making us look bad on that international stage – do you face a lot of heat for that? Yeah, I mean, I, mostly the propaganda system just ignores it, right? They just don't publish. Like I, I've written about this. I did this detailed this pretty extensively in my uh, 2016 book, A Propaganda System, how Canada's government, corporations, media, and academia sell war and exploitation. And and I worked. Um, in the uh, research department of the Communications uh, Energy Paperworkers Union, which later became uh, Unifor. And one of the things I did was I wrote op-eds on behalf of the president of the union, uh, Dave Coles, and uh, I got, I don't know, like 15 of them over like a year period or something like that. I got like 15 of them published in the Ottawa Citizen, uh, Toronto Star, Vancouver Sun, many, and, and really, really high success ratio. Along these lines, these anti-imperialist no, critiques. No, this is on, on, entirely on domestic issues. On labor writing, issues. And- yeah, on labor issues, writing, and some of them even calling for like economic democracy, like the Ottawa Citizen published this, like what well, would be viewed as fairly radical within the parameters of the, the dominant discussion. And and um, now that, of course, came with the institutional heft of a, a labor union. It wasn't just some individual writing it, uh, but it was a very it, it was a stark contrast to to writing on international issues where I basically get don't get published at all. And I had a, this personal experience going back two decades when I initially was writing more on domestic issues where I actually got things published in the Globe Mail, the Ottawa Citizen on, you know, on, on, on under my own name. And and. Um, and but on foreign policy, it's just like I mean I've submitted dozens and dozens, and I and I often tone them down to try to like you know make make it like you have a chance to get in, and so I mostly just gave up, of course, because no point in toning something down to try to get it published in a corporate outlet and then not being able to. You're better off writing like what you really believe and and just publishing it on your own site or on Rabble or on Kane Dimension or some you know left wing outlet. So. My overwhelming experience is to just ignore. Now, there have been instances, I have examples like this funny one where uh, I said a press release about my book about Lester Pearson to the, uh, what was then Embassy Magazine, now it's all part of Hill Times, and the uh, the, the guy uh, uh, had a, just a total panic because the, the top 10 was the top 10 things what you didn't know about Lester Pearson, and number one was that Chomsky considers Lester Pearson a war criminal. And he, the uh, foreign policy guy at the embassy, just sent this this email back. I don't care what Chomsky says. You you besmirch Canada. How dare you? This like really sort of. You uh, went on a list at that point. You know that, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your so, emails got blocked after that. So so you know I have had these experiences where you clearly you hit some button that that goes to a sort of liberal nationalist or kind of kind of uh, a thinking, but overwhelmingly um it's just to just ignore just you know we don't we, there's not enough of a movement there's not enough of an institutional uh structure behind these ideas that can kind of like put pressure on the major media outlets to you know even bother denying them or attacking them and so uh you're you're the more sensible thing is to just just ignore you know um so that's 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 my 
the overwhelming experience on on uh, on uh, on the K foreign policy front. It's like there's no room for gray area, right? And there's there's certain countries as well that we're just like not allowed to question our stand. But then there's also that image of Canadians as peacekeepers. And I know you've written about this extensively, trying to break that narrative up, right, with facts. And I'm wondering, do you think people are still holding on to that to the level that they did back when we named the airport after Pearson, um, when we thought peacekeeping was... Like, if you ask people for quite some time what they were proud of of Canada or what made Canada unique and you know, the best. Um, And I'm an anti-nationalist, so I don't enjoy saying any of this back. But um, they would have said our peacekeeping mission, right? That was often pointed to as like, yeah, our defining kind of approach. That was problematic in its own, right? Like we won't even have, we don't have time to get into the actual peacekeeping mission, but that seems to have gone by the wayside. Like we don't even have a facade of it anymore. So is that breaking down in the Canadian public's mind or... I think I think the specific idea of of peacekeeping has broken down significantly. The, the Trudeau government sort of dabbled in some of that uh, during the before the 2015 election and then a little bit after, uh, but mostly has just left that you know just dropped the peacekeeping issue. So and and I think that you know if it's not reinforced by by the government and if it's not reinforced by by you know. Uh, elements of the propaganda apparatus, then then it, the population tends to let it go. I, I think what the peacekeeping spoke to, I mean, there's two sides to it. I think it spoke to a positive element in the kind of Canadian psyche of wanting to like, you know, end conflict around the world. There's a sort of positive element to that. And then I think it spoke to just being bamboozled by... You're very by, generous there. <laughs> yeah, by, by what peacekeeping really, really was. Now, what I think there has happened, the, the, the sort of anti-war movement and probably the anti-imperialist movement is at a, a very low ebb. Um, really? At this, at this point in 20... No, you're not supposed to come on here and say that. Yeah, okay, so okay, I'll take it. Unfortunately, that's, uh, that's the reality. Now, having said that, I think that I have seen within my uh, uh, 20 years of engaging on foreign policy issues, I think that there was a time like around the Haiti issue where there was there was a perception even on even in the kind of the radical left there was this perception which I had at the time that that Canadian history came foreign policy wasn't so bad it was actually pretty good and 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 you know we're going kind of on the wrong trajectory trajectory I think that's very much changed I think there's now a much uh, the, the the intellectual production uh, that's critical of Canadian foreign policy in 2022 versus in 2000, I bet you have like 10 times more articles that were uh, published critical of, of Canadian foreign policy in 2022 than in 2000. It hasn't, it doesn't lead to much activism and, or much, you know, sort of uh, power in that beyond the kind of very narrow um, left-wing intellectual in, sort of intellectual strata, but, but uh, it at least leads some sort of basis for, from a long-term perspective, to, to sort of re, rethink and reorient uh, um, Canadian foreign policy. But yeah, specifically on peacekeeping, I think it, it has subsided, um, and that's in large part because uh, the government and the military, the military for a long time, this is not talk, talked about much, but the military was promoting peacekeeping as a way to justify its budget. It decided and that's kind of what Rick Hillier in the Afghanistan and the whole speech about we're, you know, we're the McCain military that kills people and we go kill the scumbags, that famous speech. Uh, that kind of was the break, the full break away from this, I, this mythology around peacekeeping to, to a different kind of uh, justification for the military. Well, the cat was out of the bag there, I guess, you know, there was no going and putting that one back. But the activism that's lacking, I'm go- you know, I write them to ask you, how do we get that institutional heft that you reference that we need to really push back in earnest rather than sitting and contemplating about it in a few articles? But as my mind is working, as it does, I'm going, well, how do we get people, leftists predominantly, uh, to prioritize foreign policy over the battles that they're facing here at home. I imagine that's part of the issue and maybe not wanting to let go because even some leftists are incredibly nationalist and don't enjoy Canada bashing, right? Just as we're not allowed to critique the NDP, we're not really allowed to 
to critique Canada on the world stage. Domestic policy, no problem. But yeah, that that kind of permeates. But how do you envision us getting substantial pushback and and to make it an more of an indent long term successes rather than the short term. I, I don't really have a, a clear answer to that. In that, I mean, I think it's just building the groups that are, you know, that's part of what trying to set up the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute is about is having some vehicle to 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 uh, not just a single issue, but sort of a general critique of Canadian foreign policy, and then you know the, all the slew of different. Uh, sort of activist groups challenging specific issues. Obviously, Palestine's the one where there's the most doing it. Um, but but I think there's a political economy to it that we have to recognize, of course, in that, in that you know, labor unions and, and, and you know, the power of the boss and capital, uh, you know, there's, there, there's a st- institutional structure that, that comes, that, you know, and enables, uh, you know, raising money and, 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 you know, like I've said that about, uh, I talk about that again in the, I think in the propaganda system book, but like, you know, the, the, the cost of one uh, 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 national uh, representative of Unifor is probably the budget of like all of the, or half of the budget of all of the anti-war groups in the country, right? And Unifor alone has like a couple hundred national representatives, right? So so we have to, you know, uh, be clear about that. And that, that so, so they, obviously most of this stuff is entirely voluntary uh, activism. And, and unlike, and I don't say this in a way to sort of like besmirch uh, union activists, but there's lots of people who get involved in union activism who see at the end of the road there may be a job, right? They, you know, maybe spend five years as a shop steward and down the road they know there may be a job, they can, you know, parlay that into something. In the case of, you know, Haiti activism or even <laughs> Palestine, maybe there's like two or three, maybe that Palestine is like five people hired that, you know, sort of full-time Palestine paid kind of people in the, maybe it's 10, I don't know, but it's a very small number. Um, and uh, so, so, so there's, there's some of these dynamics that, we have to be, you know, honest about and 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 uh, and, and recognize uh, they're not insurmount- insurmountable. I mean, it, it ultimately comes down to people taking these issues seriously, and and I, I would argue that um, that the main issues of the day can't really be dealt with in a national way. They, they you know, the climate crisis is a it's by definition it's an international issue and we have to develop a certain amount of international solidarity to be able to 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 deal with that i also would argue that what we're seeing with with uh uh, the nato proxy war with russia and quite frankly what we're preparing for which very likely be even worse with with a war with china I, i i think that it's very mistaken for um for uh, leftists, uh, environmentalists, uh, to just sort of like, hey, we'll leave that geopolitics in the hands of the, you know, the arms companies and the and the militarists, and we'll just let let them like take care of that domain, and you know, we'll we'll focus on what we, you know, we'll somehow we'll figure out dealing with the climate crisis while we're in like war with Russia and China at the same time. Uh, I don't, I don't, um, I think that's a that's a very dangerous kind of. Uh, 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 abdication really of our, our sort of political responsibility but um but yeah so so it's a matter of uh you know building it uh on a volunteer basis and building it you know by uh in terms of a you know an institution like the Canadian foreign policy institute trying to you know lots of individuals providing very small amounts of money um and having you know be maybe making that kind of thing uh replicated obviously in many other institutes and many other um uh uh, issue-specific uh, uh, campaigns. Yeah, that seems to be a theme amongst our guests, like having to rely on crowdfunding. And that, like, it's not sad or, or anything. It's just like the rea- our reality, right? And versus always up against big money there. And um, there's so much awareness raising. Quite often we talk about issues on the show that I think we're past the point of awareness raising, like climate change, um, where it's like demands for calls to action. But in the case of foreign policy, because I say this, I was listening back to your latest uh, Canadian foreign policy hour that you have every Monday, and which I think is really cool, by the way. I'm going to go off on a little tangent here because I mentioned it. You're allowed to register for the hour um, that it's on Zoom. And so you're a part of this discussion 
he has guests and panelists, so you, you do get a lot of information. But then it does become um, a part of a discussion that you can then find later on YouTube. But I thought that was a really approachable way to allow people to ask questions because foreign policy isn't our lived experience, right? Like healthcare and like more tangible things that we can understand, like generational things even. But foreign policy is completely different. And I'm listening to your latest episode where you do talk about uh, what's brewing with um, the staging area of Japan and the approach that they're taking uh, with China and the imminent danger that lays there. And so you make a great point that, you know, if we understand the urgency of climate change, but we do often quite seem to leave foreign policy for for a small fringe of the left to really take on as a full-time focus, right? It's always hard to get leftists to focus on single issues, right? But um, yeah, it just seems reckless. Yeah, completely reckless because I learned a lot (laughs) in that hour. I had it going while I was in the bathtub and I was like kind of scared, right? Like it was, it's much easier to ignore those problems and pretend that they won't ever impact us than um, to deal with it head on. You, how do you kind of relay all the context and information that's needed for someone to understand why a certain policy is bad? Because that's what foreign policy relies on, right? Like you need to know like historical context, like people looking at Ukraine and Russia is a great example. Whereas any previous context prior to Russia's invasion has been erased, Right. We, we we do not discuss the lead up to what had happened. We don't examine Canada's role in that. And uh, we're almost not allowed to, <laughs> to be honest. So, like, I don't even know if there's a question in there, Eve. I'm just kind of like processing this as I'm talking to you. But. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it is a it's a it's a it's an obstacle to how to um, and it's an obstacle I do with like, you know, my talks, right? I, I, I've you know I've done dozens or hundreds of these talks over the last fifteen years, and you're given a talk about Canada's role in Haiti, and you you know you like you you don't want to you 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 sort of have to assume much of the room knows nothing, right? And so and so how do you give those you know how do you give the background and stuff? And I people have I had this criticism about a thing I did in Nanaimo. Uh, with this Trudeau event, uh, like a six weeks ago or so, where the person was basically saying, I'm, you're covering too many issues. You've got to give a bit more detail about each issue. And you can't just presume that the people, you know, the 25 people who show up to the Nanaimo uh, Public Library, that they, they're they necessarily going to understand, they have this, you know, some degree of background. Um, and that's why, you know, Justin Trudeau can... Uh, a week ago, when he was in uh, Mexico City, he can say we're looking for Haitian-led solutions to Haiti's problems. While he's meeting, just after he meets with the U.S. president, while he's just you know in Mexico City with the Mexican president, like it's a it's a far it's a farce that he's you know say that in general that while he's in Mexico, but but it's also a farce if you know anything about Canada's role in Haiti. But his ability to make this just completely like like comical kind of statement is based upon the fact that the vast majority of Canadians know almost nothing about recent uh, Canadian history in Haiti or, you know, medium term, you know, last 20 years of Canadian rule in Haiti, last 100 years of Canada's rule in Haiti. Um, so it is, it is an obstacle. And, and then you do run into a thing where then you, by getting too detailed, then you, you sort of end up uh, uh, marginalizing a certain element of, uh, and you know, who wants to read uh, two thousand words about something, and you know, who wants to listen for it. so. Time is money, um, man. Yeah, so <laughs> time is money, exactly. So, so um, you know, and but I think that that's where uh, different forms of uh, of political engagement, right? Like I, you know, books are only speaking to a certain audience. Uh, and I've always said that with like my book tours, um, you know, I sort of see, OK, maybe like you'll do like 25 events across the country and maybe a thousand people will show up in person. and they'll, they'll hear the full like, you know, 45 minute talk. 
but then, you know, and then maybe of that, maybe I don't know, a couple hundred will, will even read the book. Uh, but that, but the whole process, you know, like the email that announcing the event, maybe 50,000 people will read that. And then maybe during the tour, you'll, you know, reach 50,000 people and, you know, a couple community radio stations, an article, maybe a one article in the Peterborough Examiner and, 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 um, and, you know, they'll get a little idea about Canada's done bad things in Haiti. And so, you know, so you've raised a flag at least, right. And it's up to people to maybe do a little bit of digging, but we know that quite often folks don't have the time for that, but I feel bad now because before we started recording, I imagine you cringed when I was like, okay, Eve, we might not have a lot of time to go into like detail on Canadian policy. You know, we don't have time to give it justice. So it's like, yeah, so I'll just leave the door open for folks to listen to Justin Trudeau and he can update us on what's happening in Haiti. So let's be fair. Let's take a few moments and update folks as best you can on Haiti, because I think that's one of the items that, yeah, we we certainly have a spot where we're not paying attention. And the level of arms trade. I, now, there's some people who are aware that we do. We are a big competitor in terms of the arms trade, but I don't think they understand to the extent it plays in politically. Just selling weapons to anybody, right? Whoever needs them. But it, it's very deliberate in our in our application. And um yeah, I think that's where folks aren't really paying attention. So I'm going to give you some space here. And I would like to, if you could educate me a little bit on what's going on in Haiti, why we're sending weapons over there and why that's a bad thing. Well, we're, we're, we're sending weapons to Haiti, light, ar- uh, light armor vehicles for the police, basically to entrench uh, oligarchic gangsterism. And uh, basically, 18 months ago, we appointed, and I say we, I mean the U.S., Canada-led core group of countries that the ambassadors basically heavily influenced Haitian policy. We appointed uh, uh, Ariel Henry to lead the country, like literally through a tweet. The guy who leads Haiti today was put there because the U.S. and Canada tweeted that he should be there. Uh, That sounds official. So, yes, exactly. So, and uh, and so back... Since 2010, the U.S. and Canada imposed the uh, PHTK, Michel Michel Martelly, who have been leading Haiti for the last 11 years, and they're 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 supported by the uh, small uh, oligarchic families that are mostly light-skinned in a country that's almost entirely black, Um, and uh, and they're totally tied into drug running and all kinds of you know criminality. And um, and that's so we've been backing this regime uh, for the past uh, 11 or so years. And uh, the you know next step back to that is in 2004, we overthrew the uh, elected government, uh, most popular politician in the history of the country, uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide and uh, thousands of other elected officials. Um, and uh, we supported a coup government for two years that killed thousands of people. That brought in a UN occupation that was there for, well, sort of continues in a, in a smaller version today, but was there for significantly for 13 years. The UN occupation brought cholera to the country because they were dumping their feces and water streams that Haitians were drinking from uh, and n- knowingly, and they continue to do it after even they brought cholera to the country, tens, tens, tens of thousands died because of cholera. Um, basically, Haiti has been a U.S. Canadian uh, colony uh, in the absolute worst sense of that for the past uh, two decades, where we, uh, if you don't have Canadian U.S. backing, you certainly are not allowed to be leader. And uh, when, a, you know, a mild reformist that took over after the coup, after we tried to rig elections in 2006, um, uh, Rene Preval, when, you know, a mild reformist uh, leader uh, they did everything they could to uh, uh, to basically force him and his party out after uh, uh, 2010, um, and uh, so it's a uh, it's a it's really brutal. Uh, it's uh, if even from you can even make an argument from a capitalist perspective. It's it's not totally a clear cut good strategy. Uh, That's what like I I hate to dumb it down, but like why then? Why do we play this role? Like some like. The resource extraction, and when we go to South America, that becomes kind of obvious. It's 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 evil and it it's imperialist, but you know we know we understand. Like we have mining companies, and we want them to flourish, and you know 
that economic model some people support. But what's going on in Haiti that would cause us to weigh in at that level? Well, from a capitalist perspective, Haiti has the lowest wages in the hemisphere. So so that's why a company like Gildan Active, where Montreal uh, Apparel Company um, is operating in Haiti, and they don't even produce the full shirt. They do the they do the heavy stitching part, right? I hate like the because electricity costs are so high in Haiti that they they'll do the more electricity intensive part in the Dominican, and just the highest labor intensive part will take place in Haiti because that's you know that they have these almost entirely women at very very low wages, um, and so so that's the capitalist perspective, and and there's constant pattern of, you know, Aristide, one of the things he did was he doubled the minimum wage. Uh, and so the King government, the American government have consistently opposed efforts to increase the minimum wage. Uh, but, but I think that you can't understand it just from a, from a capitalist perspective like that. It, it's more tied into obviously Canada's aligning with the U.S. and, and what the U.S. wants. But, but it's about basically Haiti is, is the, uh, you know, we dominate. And, and you know, in the case of Aristide, it was like he provided some degree of, an, a, of a good example of sort of breaking away from the grip of, of U.S.-led domination. And and uh, that needs to be punished. But I, I'd say, like, at a more macro level... Setting an that, example? So in terms of setting an example, breaking away from, you know, if, if Haiti can... Haiti means nothing to global capitalism. I mean, it's, you know, it's not, it's not even the size of... I don't know, like maybe the University of Toronto might, it's the, the whole budget of the University of Toronto is almost, you know, half of Haiti's entire economy or whatever, right? So, so, uh, but, 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 but if, if Haiti can break away a bit, then, well, next thing you know, you have Guatemala, then you start having Honduras, and then you start having Mexico, and that starts actually mattering to, to, you know, multinational uh, corporations. But, but, but I think that Haiti has a specific element in that it's basically, it's been punished for, over two centuries for having uh, probably the greatest example of liberation in the history of humanity. The Haitian Revolution defeated uh, slavery, defeated white supremacy, colonialism over 13 years and, you know, beat the, the French, British, Spanish uh, with U.S. backing at uh, different periods. Um, and so there's this, like, particular, like, like anti-Haitian, it's not just an anti-blackness. It's just a, it's an anti-Haitianism as well that is really deep-seated. And 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 you know we do dominate the place, so we're going to continue to dominate the place. And so long as there's not a movement in Canada or a movement in Haiti or you know elsewhere that's going to you know push back against that. Um, and uh, so yeah, so we back these interests in Haiti that you know I call it you know <laughs> oligarchic gangsterism of these small handful of families that dominate the economy, uh, mostly by you know importing stuff and uh, and who the payment for importing that stuff is Haitians that don't live in Haiti, right? It's the it's their remittances that people living in Canada or the U Haitians living in Canada, the U.S. or Chile or wherever send back, and that that's what sustains the economy, and then. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's a, it's it's a, if you want to like all the high minded rhetoric that Canadian politicians say about, you know, defending democracy in Ukraine and defending defending sovereignty in the Ukraine, spend a bit of time looking at what Canada's done in Haiti. And you'll find that it's really hard to believe that that's the objective going on in the Ukraine. It's a it's a label we've often given U.S. foreign policy as being very hypocritical. Right. Certain countries are allowed to behave in certain ways and others are not. And some are demonized for being authoritarian and then others are allowed to crack down without any kind of consequence. It's um, this also this vision that there's really just the U.S.'s way or the highway. But I don't think we're all that used to Canada playing such um, a lapdog role. Uh, I had a guest on earlier from South America, and they argued that even Stephen Harper, as awful as he was, had a more independent foreign policy than Trudeau, that it's it's becoming even more aligned with the interests of the United States, who we seem to inherently know are troublemakers, for <laughs> the lack of a better word there. Do you agree with that statement? Is this a trend in that direction? And is it unique to Trudeau? Uh, unfortunately, it's not. Um, 
If you look at Lester Pearson's foreign policy, I just wrote something criticizing uh, uh, Rick Salutin, who uh, who I you know I know and I consider a, a friend, um, columnist of the Toronto Star. He s- talked about how Lester Pearson uh, challenged U.S. war in Vietnam, and uh, that's just just absolutely factually incorrect. Uh, Lester Pearson was a big proponent of the U.S. war in Vietnam. I think that there there was time, I think, with the uh, Pierre Trudeau government, where there was a bit of a, uh, a independence streak that was uh, developed. Um, and uh, you could say maybe with Jean Chrétien, there was obviously what he did with the Iraq war in 2003 was a sign of... of um, of, he didn't give he, he didn't give the Bush administration what they wanted above above all else, which was uh, official endorsement of the coalition, the willing. He did, however, of course, provide all kinds of Canadian support for the U.S. war in in, in Iraq, uh, but didn't give the main thing he want, Bush wanted, which was the official endorsement. That was because there was the mass demonstrations, particularly the one here in Montreal, the couple here in Montreal that got to like uh, 150,000 people on some very, very cold uh, 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 winter days. Um, and it was also partly tied to the fact that Quebec elections were happening and some of the dynamics uh, at play there. But um, I think that, you know, I assume what the mention around Latin America is, is with regards to the Lima group in that, uh, and, and the Venezuelan government officials have said that, is that even Harper, who was very, you know, hostile to Chavez and, and hostile to the Maduro government, uh, it took a whole step further when Christian Freeland became uh, foreign minister and where she pushed the whole creation of the Lima group and the bid to, to oust uh, the Venezuelan government through that. And a lot of that seems to have just sort of continued on uh, even after uh, uh, Freeland uh, left. Um, I would be, you know, I'm very cautious about um, any hint at some sort of like golden age of, of uh, Canadian foreign policy where, where we were independent uh, from from the U.S. empire. So there's, there's never been one, save for kind of Iraq, where Kretchen was just allowed to walk the line a little bit. But you say that it was from, like, pressure in the streets. Is that what it's going to take? And, and when I say that, like, with Iraq, it's so clear-cut. It's like, don't go to war, right? Like, war, no war. It's not that clear-cut anymore. Not like not that it always was, but especially with something like Haiti, like selling arms where it's a lot more indirect. And then, yeah, how do you mobilize continually too? Because a lot of folks don't agree with the approach that Canada's taking with Ukraine, right? That the anti-war movement is not allowed to exist in that realm at the moment. And so I'm struggling too, and I don't want to discourage anyone, but like we have to figure out what kind of approach is going to need to change the entire foreign policy, not just one war at a time, because one, that's exhausting and it's not lasting, right? We we went to Afghanistan, right? Um, And we've, we've not really changed our tact all that much, but how did folks, what was it about Iraq? that brought folks to the street. Now, I'm, I'm saying in my mind, of all the issues that you've mentioned, Palestine has been, I think, the most successful in terms of visible resistance to that foreign policy. And, and that can be a, a slog as well. But is that resources? Is it the organizing that's done? Is there something emotional to certain countries that we will respond to and others that we just don't seem to care about? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's all of that. Uh, uh, with regards to Iraq, I, I think, unfortunately, one of the elements was that the Iraq, and I know people have said that in the U.S. a lot, and it kind of, I think, flowed into Canada, was that it was actually more of an anti-George W. Bush mobilization than it was actually an anti-war mobilization. Well, he was easy so to hate. People- yeah, so it became a sort of Democrat-Republican kind of dynamic to it. Uh, so that's one element. Uh, the, you know, the fact that you had uh, Germany and France, uh, you know, opposed, uh, that meant they were, you know, powerful countries that were, you know, part of NATO and part of the G7 and sort of viewed as traditional allies. That, that also uh, 
made things uh, easier. There also the fact that you know the Iraq thing did actually play out over. I mean, there was an early earlier war in Iraq that Canada was a major player in in the early nineties, and and so there was a certain I think consciousness on the Iraq and how much there had been of, of sort of trying to like destroy the country by the U.S. for you know a decade plus. Um, on the different issues, I mean, obviously you see, you know, a lot of people pointed out the racism with regards to uh, Ukraine, Russia, and prioritizing, you know, focusing on that versus places where, uh, you know, non-white uh, people were the uh, primary victims. Uh, that that has some, I think, somewhat complicating dynamics to it because people mostly didn't pay attention to the fact that there was uh, thousands of people killed in the Donbass in an eight-year war, uh, um, basically entirely white. Uh, uh, previously, because that was those were viewed as uh, you know it was viewed as pro-Russia to uh, to uh, to worry about those people being killed. To be honest, I'm not even sure they told us much about that. Right, like what Canadians care about it often winds down to what we get from the Star or the Globe. Well, well that's, that that is the point. That, that the point the point is is that the the, the media sets the agenda on international, uh, and, and as you pointed out, the fact that we don't have uh, a, like a lived experience, like, you know, when the healthcare system is, is when you go, you've gone to hospital and is, you know, you have to wait 20 hours or a family member or someone fairly close to you has had that experience, you sort of say, hey, there's a problem with that healthcare system. Or if you, if you work uh, minimum wage and the business press tells you that um, if you increase the minimum wage, the world's going to fall, you know, fall down, you're like, well, you know, actually it might be nice to have another dollar and a half an hour or, or, or whatever. But when it comes to international issues, they can just basically lie as much as they want. They have, we have almost no ability to ground the information they're putting forward in, in our, in some sort of, you know, making, making, make sense of it. Um, so the media's power is just that much greater. It's great on all domestic issues. It's great on uh, across the board, but it becomes even more. Um, and and on foreign policy, the range of debate is so much narrower than on 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 domestic issues. There is a sense that there is there is inst there are institutions. You know, the labor unions, for instance, is the most obvious one. They do provide some check to the power of of corporations and capital. Uh, on you know working conditions, on uh, different labor standards, and even and even they you know they they engage in uh, in uh, you know uh, campaigns for Medicare. They you know Libyans engage in a little bit of foreign policy, but mostly not. Uh, they engage in different. They fund different coalitions on 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 many different domestic issues for daycare, etc. And. Um, so, so uh, yeah, the media is power. Now, the Palestine is, the, I would say, the one issue where there has been a uh, sort of, there is a bit of an institutional uh, uh, campaigning uh, kind of structure that has developed where there are multiple groups that have been around now for many years that have, you know, fairly significant lists that when something happens, they're able to mobilize, you know, a thousand people to send an email, a couple thousand people to send an email on, on, on some Palestine. And then, and then when Israel does, you know, the worst of its uh, violence is able to sort of, you know, then we get these mass mobilizations where we get actually get people in the street in fairly significant numbers. And that institutional structure enables, you know, pan-Canadian day of action or, or whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's hard. It's hard to know what what the different issues. And then there's some. There's then there becomes a sort of like diaspora communities, like here in Montreal with the Haitian community. Uh, there is actually a put. You know, some pushback. There's some political power in in pushing back on Canadian foreign policy. Now that itself is a whole other question. They got to open up about how diaspora communities get sucked into Canadian imperialism. But but they they are also the the tend to be some of the main uh, forces uh, challenging uh, Canadian imperialism uh, as well. I was just going to say, like, the Palestinian issue there, that's one area that labor has stepped into foreign policy to a degree. You know, there's I had uh, representatives from the Palestinian youth movement on earlier on this year, and they spoke of how many unions, particularly in Quebec, but across Canada that had signed on to BDS or various 
you know, Palestinian causes there. And I know that there's a new movement, a new campaign out called Labor for Palestine. And so, yeah, that's, again, one exception. But I, you hit it right on, on the nail there that it's the diaspora that plays such a huge part in mobilizing because they do have lived experience. So that drive is there to do work beyond which some people I think can understand is, is possible um, because so much is at stake versus your average settled Canadian or nat- whatever, naturalized Canadian, ugh, you know, um, who doesn't have family somewhere under siege or under occupation, right? So trying to build allies, I find allyship in, in, in places where they don't have a vested interest is critical. And I think like storytelling has really been successful there. But um, yeah, I wanted to spend like, we're getting a little bit close to the end of our time. And I did want to ask you about your more traditionally disruptive activities, because I was giggling. (laughs) I had forgotten and I had seen the clip, but going through your Wikipedia page, um, disrupting meetings, we we talked about it just briefly earlier. so much so, like, you dumped grape juice on a uh, foreign policy minister in what addressing Haiti. It was supposed to represent blood. What do you want to accomplish when you do a performative action like that? And I don't mean performative in a slight way like it is it's it's no, it's, it's dramatized I, right I, like it's visual it's no no i i have I, i've had a number of times where the security said okay you've 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 done your performance now it's time to leave and i mostly agree with them and, and do <laughs> and so I, I, cut, yeah. we completely agree that it is a you know it's a sort of like a stunt a media stunt a political stunt um they vary. Uh, the the two what you're referring to with Pierre Pettigrew it was a conference on Haiti in 2005 here in Montreal uh, on the final press conference after this uh, at the a day and a half long uh, conference with ministers from the de facto coup government and, and many Canadian officials and uh, and I put uh, fake blood on uh, it was actually uh, cranberry juice and some like red dye and. Oh, you really yeah. worked on it. Okay, and, okay. And, uh, and we put, uh, poured it on, I poured it on uh, his hands and said, uh, Pettigrew lies, uh, Haitians die in French. Uh, Blood on his hands. Meurs. And, um, and uh, then we had, like, there was other people in the room and we had somebody who had a placard, uh, one in French, one in English, about... Uh, I think that was, I think it had pedigree lies, Haitians die. So it was, a, you know, it was a media stunt designed to... Uh, draw some, you know, attention to Canada's imperialistic policy in Haiti, which at that moment there were, you know, this was not an, any sort of abstraction. There were Canadian-backed police who were killing people regularly in Paul Place and elsewhere and uh, to push back against that. Um, the the more... Um, the, the actions on the like disruption network Canada that we started in 2019, uh, which I've you know, now done dozens of a couple, few dozen of these different disruptions, they vary a bit in terms of what the uh, the sort of political intent is. Um, social media has changed. Like in, in 2005, we didn't have you, you know Twitter and I don't know if Facebook was around, but we d- weren't using it at least. Um, and it was more just the, hey, this is a press conference. There, the cameras are there. Or we're going to you know put something in front of the cameras and and try to get a message. Out. And you just kind of hope that it makes the news real. That they don't ignore yeah. you again. And so, um, but but now with social media, that dynamic has changed a little bit. Where you can, you know, I do now. Um, I film myself as I'm telling uh, Steve Angelbo, the, the environment minister, that that he's a climate criminal for in uh, for okaying the uh, Bay du Nord uh, oil expansion. And uh, and uh, some of the clips on on social media get you know very widespread uh, um, circulation, and 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 you got to even within the different issues, you know, calling Gilbo a climate criminal. I don't you're not teaching anybody anything. I mean, most people have a sense of the climate crisis. Uh, I think you're adding a little bit of a rhetorical. Uh, um, 
you know, consciousness, say, taking it, you know, maybe a step further, which I think has some some political value. But on some of the disruptions, you 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 know, on something like um, I don't know, I did one on a, a charity that um, supports uh, Israeli c- colonialism. And I don't think most Canadians don't know that that there's all these charities that are, they're sub the Canada Revenue Agency is subsidizing that are supporting all kinds of projects in Israel that effectively dispossess uh, Palestinians. Or uh, one I did, that the one that got the most circulation was around Melanie Jolie, about a month into uh, uh, Russia's invasion, where I, she was speaking about, Canada's foreign minister was speaking about uh, Ukraine, where I challenged her on the Minsk Accord on... Uh, how do they keep letting you in? Yeah, that's a whole other interesting <laughs> question of how that, you need that, that, that dynamic uh, plays out of getting in. Getting in. And I get denied a lot. Uh, but there's different ways of, of getting in there. So, but but I think that the the politics of the disruptions are sort of interesting because if, if there are cameras there and you think that the dominant media is going to cover it, your the social media side is not that important, and you're best off getting right in front of the cameras and figuring out a way of trying to generate corporate media attention. But if if there aren't any cameras there and or you don't um, expect them, it's an issue that's you know the media just like Palestine, they're not going to cover a lot of the stuff on Haiti. They they might not cover it. if it's something that you know on Ukraine was already in the news a lot. You, the chance of them covering it goes goes up a bit. Um, but then, so the social media. So so you're trying to get um, a, an idea out there uh, on Twitter or Facebook around uh, you know some critical idea of Canadian foreign policy. Which um, you know I write articles and I you know I ha- I see how many people read the articles that I post on my website and you know it's in the hundreds. It's definitely not into the thousands, it's definitely not into the tens of thousands, and definitely not in the hundreds of thousands, where some of the disruptions, obviously you're not getting as deep into the ideas, but you're giving a little bit of the idea, they actually do get watched by you know thousands, tens, and even hundreds of thousands of people on social media. So it's another way of getting some of the ideas out there. And then also, at the, at the really successful level, breaking into the corporate media, and sometimes that has, um, that has succeeded. Um, uh, like the Steven, Steven Gilbo one where climate criminal, it got wide media attention, like three or four outlets. They, he was convening a press conference about something else and they, their stories were entirely about the disruption and about the, being called a climate criminal. And even six months later, the Washington Post and the uh, New York Times, when they did profiles of Gilbo, they referenced the fact that he was called a climate criminal at this at the press conference, um, so it's a it's a media stunt, um, but especially on foreign policy issues that that it's so hard to break through in the dominant media. Uh, this you know it's it's I think a quite useful tool because again it's so difficult. Uh, I you know writing books is there's certain people who may may read a book about Canadian foreign policy, bit bigger audience that may read an article about it. Uh, but it's really we're talking pretty small audience and uh, and you know social media and potentially even breaking into the corporate media is obviously uh, very valuable. Yeah, we, we talk on the show a lot how it takes a diverse uh, amount of tactics and approaches. People consume information different ways. They're willing to do certain things like you got to work within people's comfort zone before you push them out of it. Um, on one hand, are you trying to also encourage people to do more yeah resistance <laughs> thank you um bold actions well I, I guess I, I, I think that part of what the media does with its sort of so one-sided perspective on these international issues is that there actually are more of us out there than we understand right they it, it, they they make people feel totally isolated they make people feel that no one else cares and uh and so acts of resistance that people see sort of say, you know, hey, maybe if, if I'm not going to go and disrupt a minister, maybe at minimum I'll, I'll forward on this article to some friends or, or I'll, uh, I'll, you know, show up at the rally next week or, you know. Um, so on, on, I think a lot on the foreign policy front, particularly, uh, there are other issues as well, but people, uh, the people who sort of know or somewhat they, they feel very overwhelmed they feel they feel uh, no one else cares uh, you know whatever variation of, of that kind of uh, feeling they feel de- demobilized and so 
you're hoping to engender some degree of, of uh, pushback and and uh, and create a sense that um, you know of, of activity, um, however uh, small and, and somewhat fleeting uh, a minute disruption of a minister is. <laughs> no, that's entirely true. Because those fleeting moments, you have no idea what their impact is, right? Like whether they circle back to your website and read a more in-depth article to gain that knowledge, or, you know, you've just at least raised one of those flags we talked about earlier. It's like, you'll never really know the depth of that impact. Right. Um, but you know, it had some, and I, I absolutely cringe when folks criticize different tactics in this fight, because we're all just figuring it out. There is no book on what, what to do. We don't know what works and what doesn't work at this point. Not in the the long-term sense of things. And I'm specifically, I guess, thinking of the youth and the just oil movement, just you talking about that disruption and uh, how they, you know, were throwing things on works of art that were under glass, tomato soup, right? Representing uh, blood again. And all, all the condemnation that it received or criticism for being disruptive or destructive uh, sparked 10 times as more discussions on what is acceptable activism or what other tactics could we use that would be more effective? Um, And why are they doing that? You know, so um, I want to encourage you to keep doing your work and I will continue to read it. I I've registered for your next Canadian foreign policy hour. I want to experience that. I I'm sorry. I only caught it on YouTube. I should have chimed in earlier, but um Thank you. We'll probably pick your brain again as we really are exploring South America. Um, but uh, we'll call you on there for we'll have like a million questions on that and, and the Lima group and whatnot. But is there anything that you would like to point folks towards as we sign off here? Works that are coming down or actions that you're planning? Um, no, I mean, I... Uh I have a website where I post my articles uh, at some point, uh, evengler.com. Uh, if people are interested in, in sort of keeping track of Canadian foreign policy in a, in a you know, fairly passive form of engagement, which is always the first step towards a more active form of engagement, I think I would uh, invite people to get on the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute's email list. It's a list of, uh, I think, around 15,000. And and there's sort of regular uh, webinars and you know some action alerts, announcements, sometimes about demonstrations. And um, but it's a it's a uh, a bit of a community of of people trying to uh, challenge Canadian Canadian foreign policy. So so I would invite people to check that out and uh, and um, uh, uh, yeah get on that get on that uh, Canadian foreign policy institute's uh, uh, email list. I'll be sure to. You know, the audience knows this, but I'll remind them that the show notes are always full of links back to the work of our guests and the things that they suggest we should read more about, because foreign policy is also fun to learn about. I'm a political nerd, so like maybe that's unique, but you're always like that that folk that person at your family dinner with these, like, did you know Canada is doing this? <laughs> and uh, there's no shortage of horrors uh, that would really kind of challenge your family's perspective on um, the nationalist pride that I think plagues us to many uh, depths. But I think that's an episode in itself, one I've been meaning to tackle. But you, you've kind of touched on nationalism and, and a whole bunch of great things here. Again, thank you so much for taking time to come on and... Um, It was a pleasure meeting you. Likewise. Thanks for having me. That is a wrap on another episode of Blueprints of Disruption. Thank you for joining us. Also, a very big thank you to the producer of our show, Santiago Halu Quintero. Blueprints of Disruption is an independent production operated cooperatively. You can follow us on Twitter at BP of Disruption. If you'd like to help us continue disrupting the status quo... Please share our content, and if you have the means, consider becoming a patron. Not only does our support come from the progressive community, so does our content. So reach out to us and let us know what or who we should be amplifying. So until next time, keep disrupting.